great to have you here. Thanks so much. Do you guys want to come down? All right, thanks so much. Hope everyone's having a great day. Guys, thanks so much for joining us here at the, uh, the second and final day of, uh, of ZB Live. And thank you so much to everyone who joined us yesterday on the first day as well. Hope everyone's had a great time, listened to some very interesting conversations, and has been making some, some great connections as well. Uh, so I'm Dan. I'm one of the co-founders here at Zebu and the director of communications. And I'll be moderating the panel today on asset tokens, crypto, and the climate crisis, a nexus of opportunity. So I'm joined on stage today by some very, very prominent, very, very prolific individuals, all of whom are leading experts within their respective fields, and all of whom are making an incredibly meaningful, incredibly tangible impact, not just on Web3, not just on furthering and advancing the agenda of Web3, but on arguably the most important, the most fundamental issue of them all, which is the climate crisis. So it's a great honor to be joined on stage today by all of them. So on that note, I'm gonna hand over to our panelists to give a bit of background on themselves, a bit of an introduction, and let us know how they are contributing to the space. Peter, do you want to uh, kick us off? Sure, hello, I'm, I'm Peter. I, I have a very, I'm a one-trick pony. I only understand carbon markets, but I understand carbon markets really well. So my background is carbon trading, but it's carbon commodity trading. So we treat carbon dioxide removal specifically the way we would treat any other commodities, oil, gas, copper, what you name it. And we are now preparing for what we think will be the largest commodity market by 2050, which is the market for carbon dioxide removals. And we're creating a, a product that makes the thesis that carbon dioxide removal will appreciate in value significantly over the next 30 years investable. Perfect. Thanks so much. Lord Vizey. Uh, I'm Ed Vizey. I was David Cameron's technology minister until I was sacked by Theresa May. And uh, I'm now, uh, then I was sat by Boris Johnson, and now I'm in the House of Lords. So it's been an incredible journey. Um, I've just joined the Global Advisory Board of Binance, so you can read all about that in today's Times, slamming me for doing so. Uh, and I also work with Peter, and I'm very interested in, obviously, the crypto blockchain space and have been for many years, obviously, as the Minister for Technology, I spent a lot of time with David Cameron, encouraging new technologies, supporting inward investment into the UK, uh, trying to push regulation to adapt and update to new technologies rather than trying to force new technologies to comply with analog uh, regulation. Uh, obviously, I believe that crypto is an important asset class. The blockchain is obviously here to stay. Web3 is developing at a rapid pace. Politicians and policymakers need to be across all this, understand it, uh, embrace it. But also, I felt very strongly as the Minister for Technology that it is a two-way street and it is a dialogue and that uh, the tech community mustn't simply dismiss uh, policymakers' concerns and uh, take refuge in the fact that policymakers don't understand technology. Uh, politicians and policymakers represent the public square we represent the kind of concerns that ordinary citizens feel about technology, particularly its rapid implementation. So great companies uh, like Peter's will work closely with policymakers to adapt, uh, to establish a win-win. And obviously the title of this panel discussion is front and center of some of the opportunities presented by uh, crypto and blockchain. And if we can establish uh, companies that can help with carbon reduction and authenticate genuine carbon reduction, we will make uh, genuine progress. Oh, you've got a microphone. I have my own. Great. Lord Vesey, thank you so much. Hakan. Thank you very much. Uh, Håkan Nordqvist. Uh, I spent my, uh, most of my working life in a Swedish home furnishing company called IKEA, and which is about physical products in the homes of people. So it's probably as far as you can come from crypto and, 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 and these type of things. But I have worked with sustainability and business development within IKEA for many, many years. The last 11 years, I led the sustainability innovation team where we built a number of new businesses uh, within IKEA. 
Among others, we built a new energy business, a utility, where we sell solar panels, electricity, heat pumps, and so on to customers. Uh, spent a lot of time in, in uh, the climate area, uh, working to both avoid but also reduce the climate impact of, uh, of IKEA. Um, I can definitely see that new technology uh, has a, an important place to play in how we can tackle climate change. So that's why I'm so inspired and it's been and excited to be here today to talk about it. Perfect, Hakan. Thank you so thank you so much, uh, Elias. Good morning. Uh, my name is Elias Schultz. I'm a frontier markets uh, investor, entrepreneur, mostly in the tech and media space. Um, and excited to be here. We teamed up with Peter recently um, because of his vision. We love zero to one startups, and this is probably the most exciting one we've seen recently. And then two, the impact uh, that CDRs, carbon dioxide removals, and that opportunity can have in frontier markets, um, where I spent most of my career, uh, we think is really uh, powerful as well. So excited to be here. Perfect, thanks so much guys. Let's hear a big round of applause for our panelists today. Perfect. All right. Well, look, just jumping straight into it then, Peter, I want to, want to start with you. So you're obviously an expert in the field with a PhD. What does the net zero concept actually mean? Can you give us some info on, you know, what it actually means? What, what are carbon credits and what are the differences between different types of carbon credits? Yeah, sure. I'd love to. So the net zero concept looks at the problem of climate change from the perspective of the atmosphere. So you, you look at the atmosphere and what we as society have done over the last hundred years is we put too much greenhouse gas into the atmosphere fundamentally. And what we are doing is we, are, um, we have flows of greenhouse gas into the atmosphere and then we have flows of greenhouse gas out of the atmosphere. And the idea of net zero is to balance those flows. So we, we need to make the flows of greenhouse gas into the atmosphere smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and the flows of greenhouse gas out of the atmosphere bigger and bigger. And net zero actually is just the first step in our journey. So once we've achieved the balance, then we have to make the flows of greenhouse gas into the atmosphere even smaller and the flows out of the atmosphere even bigger so that we start sucking all of that excess greenhouse gas out of the atmosphere so we are back to the pristine uh, atmosphere that we have to have. For carbon markets, and there are many types of carbon markets that are designed for different purposes. It means that if you have a carbon market that aims to help net zero, you need to create a carbon credit that represents a physical flow of a ton of greenhouse gas out of the atmosphere. It's called carbon dioxide removal because you're removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And other carbon markets, they're designed for different purposes. So uh, a lot of other carbon markets are designed in a way where the concept is if, that you can pay someone else to reduce their emissions and then the carbon credit represents other people's emission reductions. And they, they can be great for that purpose, but for the purpose of achieving net zero in the net zero concept, there's a fundamental difference between carbon dioxide removals and these types of emission reduction credits. Perfect. Thanks so much. I don't know if anyone wants to add anything to that, if anyone else has any thoughts around that issue. I always have something to say after Peter says something. Um, no, I think what ma makes this particularly exciting is using the crypto space, broadly speaking, to build um, sort of an asset class that's sort of between the super high risk, what do you call it, you know, Ethereum, NFTs, and USD or USDT. All right. And the idea is that we're creating something reliable, blue chip, as Peter likes to say, and in doing so, um, bringing some sustainability, some uh, perhaps uh, a, a little bit of um, reparation to the space, if you will, um, given all the, the, you know, the, the sort of green harm that uh, crypto has done over the past and turning that around so that crypto becomes uh, carbon positive. And, and, and re sort of framing the narrative. So for me, that's, that's what makes it exciting. I don't know if that helps answer some of the, the no, questions. Perfect, there. no, absolutely, thanks so much. Now Elias, kind of over, um, Hacken, sorry, over, to, uh, over to you, you're obviously the head of sustainability at IKEA, a position you've held for over a decade. How have you found trying to you know, reconcile 
sustainability with, you know, within, you know, a commercial giant? What kind of difficulties have you encountered over the years in that role? Yeah, many difficulties. Um, but I think talking about sustainability for the sake of sustainability is never going to be a winning concept in that sense. You need to connect it to the business. And um, firmly, I, th I believe that the business we will have in five to ten years will be all about sustainability. We won't talk about sustainability. We will talk about good business and profitable business and the most profitable business uh, will be around those businesses that tackle climate change and other uh, big sustainability questions uh, around us. So I think we are going to move from sustainability into a hardcore business situation where we tackle those type of things because it's good for the planet, it's good for people. And then if it is that, then it's normally a very good business. Perfect. All right. Lord Beatty, I'd be, I'd be really keen to get your thoughts on this. You know, what's the government doing to, to kind of help facilitate that, to help, you know, these commercial giants achieve sustainability and achieve, you know, net zero? Uh, well, I mean, it's a huge uh, topic. Um, and it's, uh, in some ways, weirdly still a mildly controversial topic, though it shouldn't be, uh, particularly with this new... Uh, government. But in theory, um, first of all, the, the war in Ukraine should have focused people's minds that the whole point about net zero uh, is not simply a sort of goody two-shoes approach to be doing the right thing, but it is the way as well that we can achieve uh, energy security and energy uh, resilience. You know, we've, in the UK, uh, effectively weaned ourselves off coal power, and we're one of the largest countries in the world in terms of per capita uh, to rely on offshore wind energy and obviously there have been subsidies for the last 10 or 20 years for solar power as well and we now need to build a proper net zero future in terms of putting in place the infrastructure for renewable energy and you can do that through subsidies and through tax incentives and there are obviously green tariffs on electricity uh, and the government needs to keep looking at those but of course because of the energy crisis in Ukraine we have this paradox where we're looking at net zero and realizing that it's at the heart of energy security, but also seeing uh, the green levies on our energy bills as somehow a tax that we must uh, reduce in order to uh, aid people's uh, finances during the, through the cost of living crisis. So it is a complicated and difficult area and where, where I think that the crypto debate and what Peter is doing at net zero could be uh, extremely valuable is it's not just a question of us achieving a net zero target, but it's also a question of us starting to take carbon out of the atmosphere. And if we can do that in a reliable way based on the blockchain, uh, where, these, uh, where, this, uh, where these actions can be uh, catalogued uh, securely, uh, then that is a great future. The real challenge in any government, and it's true in the UK government when I worked as a minister, is that too many too many departments work in their silos. So when you're looking at things like net zero, uh, you are looking at it through the prism of the Ministry for Energy, the Minister for Energy. Uh, you are working with business, but you're still working at arm's length with business, when business should be part of the joined up equation. And you're still working on energy technology, but not joining up with different technologies like crypto and joining the dots and working out how you can create a sustainable uh, ecosystem going forward. So that's where the real opportunity lies, I think, with having people uh, like IKEA and Net Zero at the table talking about sustainability. Oh, perfect. So much. Peter, anything to add to that? <laughs> no, I think that for governments around the world, not just in the UK, it's, it's hard to regulate for net zero. So I think one day, I think that we will have governments and they will just implement the rules and they will say, every company has to balance all of their emissions with removals and then we are at net zero once they, they enforce those rules. But it's hard for them. They have to get elected. It's, it's not easy, right, for politicians. I believe this is the opportunity for the private sector to lead, lead the way and help future governments to more easily regulate and follow. And I think what is so amazing for us right now is that over the last three years, a lot of companies have already committed to get to net zero. So mo most major companies have said by 2030, some by 2040, they will be at net zero, which means all of their emissions will be balanced out. Now, 
it's of course we have to create that market we have to create the infrastructure for these companies to comply but once we've achieved that it will be so much easier for the governments to follow and regulate in that direction that the companies have already led no perfect no i think that makes a lot of sense elias i mean i'd be really keen to get your thoughts on this as well especially kind of through the lens of frontier markets right especially africa you know are these frontier markets benefiting from this increasing intersection between crypto and the carbon markets? Yeah, I mean, if you look at it, for example, I think since 1751, so the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, I think Africa has contributed 3% of entire you know, carbon emissions compared to everyone else in the world. So there's a question of opportunity and kind of redistributive justice here that's also kind of important. And they can work together with capitalism in the right mix. Um, so a lot of the projects that you know, we're looking at are from frontier or developing countries. And, and, you know, that's an amazing opportunity, um, you know, to, to for whether it's just reforestation or other nature-based solutions. Um, I think that investors will start to look at these economies and say, yeah, this is beyond the coal, beyond the oil. Um, there are other natural resources here available um, and sort of mining CDRs. Now, that has to be done in a balance because you don't want to, I mean, everything is an opportunity cost. So you don't want to do that at the expense of agriculture, for example, but you might do that at the expense of, of something else that has a lesser return kind of socially. Um, so that's where governments also and aid agencies and experts that aid agencies hire can come in and help advise these governments to make sure that the mix is done correctly. Um, so we are working with projects in Laos and Paraguay um, and where, where you kind of have a, a double bottom line net positive impact, right? Not just financially, but socially, um, and of course for the environment. No, perfect, Look, thanks so much. I think that makes a lot of sense, right? And, you know, at this point, I kind of want to move from slightly more macro topics to slightly more micro topic, right? And look at some specifics. So on that point, are carbon removal tokens a good investment? You know, if so, like, <clears throat> Who are the you know who are the leaders within that within that area of the crypto space? Just going to throw this out there. I don't know if anyone wants to. Peter wants to volunteer. Take it. Shall I pick that up? So the, the way I look at this, right, is that in the year 2050, we will be at a society where every emission, every greenhouse gas emission of the whole of society will have to be balanced by carbon dioxide removals. So that's most company, countries have committed to that. Most companies have committed to that. At that moment, the asset class, carbon dioxide removal, is going to be the largest asset class of all commodities. It's going to be bigger than oil, bigger than the other commodities. And that market has not yet started. So we are in this amazing situation that we are moving the, uh, into a 20-year period where the whole society will transition to net zero. That will throw up tremendous opportunities, both in abatement opportunities, so reducing emissions, but also carbon dioxide, uh, carbon dioxide removal creation opportunities. And the asset that is carbon dioxide removal over that period is going to appreciate in value tremendously. Perfect. Anyone have anything to, to add to that? Hakan, what's your, what's your view on this? Oh, I, I agree. I think uh, to tackle climate change, you need to work on three, three areas. I mean, you need to work to avoid your climate uh, or climate impact. And you can do that through uh, driving an electric vehicle instead of a diesel vehicle. You can um, contract electric vehicles for your last mile delivery instead of diesel vehicles. You avoid uh, carbon. The second one is you reduce carbon. So you use technology to reduce your carbon uh, impacts. I mean, from, from an IKEA point of view, it would be that uh, we provide LED lights. Uh, uh, we have um, uh, appliances which is uh, sort of energy efficient and so on and so on. And the third one is um, the carbon capture. So we have a legacy, all sort of carbon in the air that we need to take away. And I think that's important to have carbon capture as one of the three main main areas to work with to tackle climate change. Um, the problem is that we don't have it uh, a system working globally. So people are claiming things, we're doing things, but it's not sort of a unified quality of what we're doing or uh, we don't have a, a way of follow-up. So what Peter is, is doing here and, and, and uh, trying to do 
is actually helping us all to come to a state where we can actually say this is now an equal playing field and we can have something that everyone can see uh, equally and that we, could, we do the same thing and we get the same sort of uh, level of it. And I mean, how can crypto and you know, blockchain tech, how can that help with the, the unification there that you were just talking about? Shall I pick that up? Sir? So I think the service for society that the carbon tax that is now super essential is to create a visible price price curve actually for carbon dioxide removal going out into the future that is based on fundamental supply and demand dynamics in a society that transitions to net zero and that price curve that should then trigger three groups of people to work very hard to figure out solutions the companies that have to get to net zero what are the investments that they have to make what should they focus on to get to net zero in the most cost efficient way so ton cost per ton that's what they should think of abatements or removal and this price curve will guide will guide the corporates in that but it will also guide all of the people that will provide the abatement solutions now and in the future the r d the things that will change that will come better and also the suppliers of carbon dioxide removal solutions all these groups need to work together to bring the costs of getting to net zero as low as possible and crypto is at the moment the best way to create fast this uh, transparent price curve at, right now the price for carbon dioxide removals is completely opaque no one knows what is the true cost of carbon dioxide removal we need to get the market going the market for end user investors but also financial investors so that we create this transparent price curve that can set the pace for the whole industry to get to net zero cost efficiently no i think that's really interesting i mean i'd be really keen to explore the kind of regulatory implications around that you know you start talking about asset back tokens you start thinking about security tokens you know and this, you know immediately you start thinking about you know regulation regulatory compliance that kind of stuff what are governments doing you know are governments facilitating um you know this kind of environment they're facilitating this um you know this this new emerging technology and these technological solutions or are they kind of hindering it through regulation and lord basically i'd be interested to get your view on this well well i think at the moment governments are hindering it i mean we just had a statement from the white house last week which was significant in terms of movement towards creating a framework for uh, crypto regulation but governments are scared of crypto and it goes back to my opening remarks about the relationship between technology and policy makers there's no doubt that when crypto became a thing as it were uh, there were many companies out there that played fast and loose uh, either with the asset class or uh, in terms of proper financial regulation in terms of KYC regulation, anti-money laundering regulation, and so on. People didn't want to play by the old rules, as it were, and that put crypto in a very difficult place as far as policymakers were concerned. But it is also the case that policymakers tend to be very slow at adapting regulations to new technology, and it is also the case that vested interests, traditional industries, whether it's the taxi industry or the financial services industry, will be lobbying behind the scenes to... Uh, slow down or even stop uh, a regulatory framework coming into being in order to hinder competition. I am unashamedly pro-regulation. Pro-regulation is good for everyone. It is good for business who, uh, because they can operate in a safe environment and it's good for business because it gives confidence to their customers uh, in order to uh, you know, encourage transactions uh, and engagement. Uh, so there's no doubt that we're, I think in 2023, going to start to reach a tipping point. Uh, some countries are more advanced than others because, again, in terms of regulation, there is, for countries, a competitive advantage. If you can get out of the gate first, it's complicated, actually. If you can get out of the gate first, you can attract the innovation and the innovative companies to come and base themselves in your jurisdiction. At the same time, if you wait a bit second mover advantage if you like in the regulatory framework you can see what's worked in the first mover countries and what hasn't worked and refine your regulations that way but you can't sit back you have to lean in uh, and i don't think we're doing enough 
uh, because we don't understand, certainly in the UK and in other jurisdictions, uh, the massive advantages that crypto and blockchain can bring to a whole ream of different uh, sectors, not least net zero. And I, th I think that's a really interesting point. And what can be done to address that lack of understanding, would you say? Or what should be done to address that lack well, of Well, I think it's down to political leadership. And it's about, to a certain, so look, uh, in government, you don't like taking risks. Although if uh, anyone's been following the great fiscal event this morning, we've got a chancellor who is quite keen, it seems to me, on taking big risks. So it'll be, see, be interesting to see whether his bold moves pan out. Uh, you know, the FCA at the moment got stung uh, from a, a, a a financial services company that went under hurting a lot of consumers so it's it's in cautious mode and we all know the cliche no one ever got fired for saying no so if you don't do anything you massively reduce your risk of doing the wrong thing and it requires uh, strong I think political leadership and indeed regulatory leadership to say uh, to acknowledge that this technology is not going away to acknowledge that technology does change things, to acknowledge that you have to have a dialogue and do your very best to adapt uh, and institute regulation. And also to accept that your first stab at regulation may not be as effective as you want it to be. Uh, but you do have to lean in and you do have to be proactive and it does require leadership. Oh, perfect. Okay, and, and Hakan, I'd be very keen to get your um, your thoughts on this, you know, what's your experience been with regulation? Have you found it to be beneficial? Have you found it to be a hindrance? You know, what's your take on it from your decade at IKEA? Yeah, I think uh, regulation is needed, regulation is good, but you need to have it, I see it as a uh, collaboration between governments, companies and technology. So I think the regulation should set the direction and uh, for what we want to do for in the future and create the conditions for that. Companies are very happy to have a leveled playing field through regulation. Um, and I think actually we should, in European Union and across the world, regulate more to get that even more even the playing field for every company that wants to drive climate action. Uh, and then but it should be in a collaboration. So it shouldn't be sort of going in different directions all over the place, but it should be companies, governments, and then using technology and looking into technology, how can technology enable this and, and accelerate the actions that we need to take to attack climate change? But definitely regulation is needed. And I think uh, personally, the politicians should be more bold and, and stick out their necks a bit and, and actually regulate more. There you go. Okay, brilliant. Look, guys, at this point, I just want to kind of move the discussion on to, you know, the current solutions and what the current landscape looks like. You know, are there any, <coughs> sorry, are there any um, solutions out there which you regard as being particularly good or, you know, conversely to that, particularly bad at tokenizing carbon credits on the blockchain? So I don't want to talk negatively about you know, mm. other companies. Right. But I think what we, for the um, approach to make carbon dioxide removal investable, I think we're just at the beginning of the journey, right? So um, I think that's something new that is coming. A lot of companies that have been moving into the um, tokenization of carbon space, they have focused more on the other types of carbon credits that are designed for other purposes. So it's more focused on carbon credits uh, that represent emission reductions done by, by projects and other people. And that's just a different, a ty different type of product. And that specific product, I think it will eventually come to an end as, as society, as corporates are taking the net zero transition more and more seriously and are starting to balance out their physical flows into the atmosphere with physical flows out of the atmosphere. No, perfect. I think that makes a lot of sense. Elias, do you have anything to add to that point? The current landscape of solutions which are out there? Um, yeah, so I lived in Ethiopia for a few years and they were one of the biggest coffee exporters, right? And what matters to, to, to those exporters, to those farmers, is that there's actually 
there's a fungible nature when you come to these commodities. You have a grade A Arabica coffee, you know you're going to get a grade A Arabica coffee. Starbucks can import that, and that creates a lot of uh, systemic function um, and allows for the transparency, which allows for trust, which allows for an efficient market. Right now, we don't have that when it comes to whether it's emission reduction uh, credits or CDRs. Um, so I think there's a, a huge latent demand for this type of marketplace, if you will, um, where everyone knows it's fungible, it's not niche products, it's not like you gift, oh, I'm, this, I'm gifting you a, a ton from Laos, I'm gifting you a ton from Paraguay. It's that there's an interchangeable, high quality carbon dioxide removal representing a physical ton, um, and you can trust that. And it's registered, um, and it can be traded, it can be consumed, it can be burnt. Um, and that's what we're missing. And I don't think, I mean, these other firms out there, uh, I don't think they ha have exactly that same vision. They serve a market and that's great. And like Peter, I don't wanna speak negatively about their efforts, which is important for the whole ecosystem. Um, but what we're building is fundamentally different in that regard. Okay, perfect. Look, makes sense. Guys, I'm just conscious of time now. I just kind of wanna um, wrap things up by kind of asking you individually, you know, as entrepreneurs, as experts, as leaders in your respective fields. What have you guys personally done? Now, you know, how have you shaped your teams? How have you shaped your organizations, um, you know, your companies, your, <clears throat> your departments um, to address this issue and to you know, get them ready for you know, achieving net zero? And you know, what challenges have you encountered when doing that? And you know, what risks did you have to take to facilitate that and to set that up for success? So if we want to start with Peter and then work our way down. So I strongly believe in the idea that the purpose of all companies is to solve society's problems profitably. That's mm. the approach that all companies should take. And that's how we are setting up the net zero company as well. We want to solve a very important problem of society. But we want to solve it very profitably. And in this space where not everyone has the most positive view of crypto or carbon markets. I think in this space specifically, it's important to go about with a lot of integrity and transparency so that people fully understand how are we designing our product? What exactly are we doing? Um, how are we auditing it? How can we, how can we create the trust that the product that we are offering in the market actually truly represents a ton of uh, carbon dioxide removed from the atmosphere? Perfect. Lord Vasey. I don't have a team. I'm a sole trader, plowing my own furrow all on my own. So I don't have the opportunity to shape anyone's approach. But I'm on the board of the Tate, and we do talk a lot uh, about sustainability. We've got four huge buildings, all pretty old, and uh, it's a constant focus of ours to uh, refocus our teams on sustainability. And we're doing a, a significant redevelopment in, in Liverpool, which is going to massively reduce our carbon footprint and be net zero. Thanks so much. Hakan? Yeah, I think, I mean, as I said from the beginning, I think climate change is not a sustainability issue. It's the biggest societal challenge we have, uh, we, we are facing as a species. Uh, so it's a critical business um, issue that you need to address in every company. Um, so what, I mean, uh, IKEA has set up uh, um, a number of activities, as I said, avoiding climate or carbon, reducing the carbon, and also engaging into uh, carbon capture uh, in there. And of course, working together with the legislators and, and in different parts of the world to make sure, to push and to make sure that the legislation is coming in the right direction. And it's not easy for the legislator. I mean, there is a mix of things they need to take care of. But um, what I meant with sticking out the neck is there to take the right decisions, there to put the right uh, uh, legal frameworks in place. Uh, there is a legacy there, but we also have a future we need to look into that we need to start uh, addressing here and now. Okay. Cognizant of the time and, and realize I think everything well has been said, but look forward to, uh, we're a pretty small team, but look forward to uh, buying our own CDRs to make sure that we're properly offset in the years ahead from, uh, from Net Zero Company. All right, perfect. Guys, look, thank you so much. Let's have a big round of applause for our speakers.